State of Play is a thriller, but what Kevin has been able to do is to keep us guessing all the way through. It's such a the spider web, and everyone's so connected to one another, and you do get personally involved. I'm just terrified. Things happen at the beginning of the story which appear to be unrelated. But as the story moves on, they begin to connect up. It provides a lot of authenticity because the issues that a lot of them are dealing with are real. Amidst all that, it's set in the world of politics in Washington. You know, murder, sex, and greed. We were interested in contrasting theatrical Washington with the backstage Washington, the halls of power and the sort of corridors of where it really happened. Kevin started out in documentaries, so authenticity for him was incredibly important. There's nothing in there that's made up, and that's scary and also gives the film a unique texture. Cut. Cut in. The cut. The origin of this film is that uh, Paul Abbott, a great British uh, television writer, wrote the series like six, seven years ago. It was the best piece of television I'd ever seen. Action! I thought, what a rare piece of source material to try to adapt for a U.S. feature. You realize you can't make another version, you have to reinvent. And of course, part of the way we got around that was we kind of changed it rather radically. Here we go. We're rolling. Set in America, set in D.C., it has a whole different dynamic between the characters. And action. Funnily enough, it's much more about journalism. The journalists feed off the politicians and vice versa, and they have a very interesting relationship because they really need each other, and at the same time, they're completely, utterly suspicious of one another. Hold on for one second. To set a movie right in the middle of that and then use all of that, it's fun. It's a fun project. scope of it was challenging. So we had a worldwide search looking for the right director. I think we were really lucky to come across Kevin. I'm appreciated in the two films of his that I've seen, Touching the Void and Last King of Scotland, that he was able to create tension on the screen. And that's what you need in a film like this. Kevin coming from a, a documentary background, he brings this real immediacy in the way of shooting. And you know that right away because he can tell you what he needs in five words or less. He can walk up and whisper in your ear, try this or try that, and it changes the whole tape. You're back here, hanging on to the car, like clearing into that column. Roll sound. AK remark. Action. The hardest part of the script was to sort of keep the integrity, keep the thrills that was in the original miniseries. Cut. Perfect. It's incredibly hard to be able to keep that integrity when you're trying to balance all the other elements that an audience expects. We started working with great writer Tony Gilroy, who's best known for the Bourne films and for directing Michael Clayton. And so the film has this unique balance between hard-hitting, visceral moments on one hand Action. and human, touching, authentic moments on the other. And I think it's the combination of all these issues that make this kind of thriller stand out. What I love about State of Play is the collision of newspaper journalism and politics in a thriller. And our cast just brings everything that's been written to life. As a producer, I was in a place where perhaps I'll never be again. Everyone and anyone wanted to be part of this feature. It was really hard to figure out who to have instead of the editor played by Bill Nye, who was so wonderful in the original series. And then I had what I think was my best casting idea in the whole process. When I realized that, you know, the secret was to cast a woman, I thought, ah, that's it, you know, that's how we can do something fresh. I thought, who is better than Helen Mirren? So, where are we? Was he nobbing her or not? Cut. I like that a lot. In the, the very first draft, it was a much more even-handed, generic kind of boss. Action. Through research with the Washington Post, all our actors that were playing journalists 
went through uh, the Washington Post to learn what it meant to be as a journalist. Well, aren't you going to send it? Speaking to journalists, I thought there's a, a side to the whole newspaper world that is can be very, very cynical, and I wanted to bring some of those elements into this character. So I really wanted to kind of spice her up a bit. I know you got shot at That's last night, and I should be making you a nice cup of coffee, but you're so, so fucking angry. <laughs> I've cut! <laughs> The Washington Post also gave us their Metro editor, R.B. Brenner. He became everybody's favorite person on set. He's been great because he's been able to explain things directly from the perspective of, of a newspaper. They were still evolving the type of reporters that Cal and Della would be. We talked about tactics when you, when you go out on the story. You know, how do you interview someone who doesn't want to give you information? Even down to little details like if you want to knock on a door, how do you do it? How do you dress? The one great note that I got was that they never want to overdress. They always want the person they're interviewing to be at an advantage. Russell was so game for that. He loved the really gritty reporters, that I, pictures that I showed him. Russell came in and took the character by the scruff of the neck and he totally understood what it would be. And the thing about Russell is instead of doing that just in a superficial Hollywood way, Russell just took that and said, okay, I'm gonna be eating chili dogs. I'm gonna have the messiest apartment on earth. I'm gonna be the nightmare you never want your daughter to go out with. And he created that. That's why he's a great actor. It's all in service of the character. And not many movie stars are like that. Our new corporate owners won't let me print any of this unless I have one of the major players on the record. And the only person who could do that won't. Would you like to tell me why? Or is it just that you shagged his wife? The really what sells the role is intelligence, understanding, and always be thinking. And the thing about these actors in particular is they're extraordinarily smart. Particularly with, with Rachel, because I didn't really know her, her work, and she's a really good actress. I couldn't be a journalist at all. <laughs> That's what I've discovered from doing this. Background and action. You're an old friend of Stephen Collins from college, right? She sort of first seems kind of lightweight and chirpy, beautiful and charming, and kind of has this girlish quality that is so good next to the gruff Cal McCaffrey. And when she understands the emotion of a scene, it's just sort of there in her face, in her eyes. If I could just have a few more days with it, I promise you I'm not going to let you down. Don't throw those dewy cub reporter eyes at me, it's nauseating. One of my favorite lines in the movie, which actually was an ad lib by Rachel, I think, which was uh, the cop asks her, so how long have you known Cal? And she says, um, too long. The way she says it is so wonderful. And then you realize that actually she's kind of made a steal, this character. And that's Rachel herself, you know, she's like that. With Stephen Collins, that's played by Ben Affleck. I think he's the perfect congressman. He's got those looks, he's got that suavity, and he's also got a huge interest in politics. That's one of the things that makes him such a great fit with this film. Before filming, he flew out here and spent time on the Hill and sat in and hearing rooms and talked with congressmen to really understand what Washington was about. Kevin is a phenomenal filmmaker. He knows more about American politics than most Americans. Creating these detailed characters, the stories that they've written, what they sort of gnash their teeth on. There are things in our movie which are a homage to films we made before about conspiracies in Washington, D.C., and politics and journalism. And obviously the most famous of those is All the President's Men. And we have an element of the plot that takes place at the Watergate building itself. And we have a sequence in an underground garage. So it's kind of aware of that heritage. When Kevin did The Last King of Scotland, he went to Uganda and shot it. So his natural reaction was, I want to go to, to the reality. My instinct was, let's film it all in DC. And then, of course, it became obvious that that was like a nightmare. To shoot in Washington is challenging. There's close to six different law enforcements that you have to deal with here. And it's so bureaucratic. You know, there were places we were meant to film, then like two days before, they would say, oh, you know, we've, you've been talking to us for eight months about shooting here, but we've changed our mind. We don't want to have you here. Oh, my God. And I think a lot of directors, after realizing how difficult Washington is, would say, oh, I, I only want to go there for a week. But we wanted to spend more time out here. And in the end, we did two-thirds of the shooting in Los Angeles and one-third in Washington, which is still an enormous amount of the movie. 
DC is two cities. It's the it's the capital. It's all the big monuments. It's kind of you know the center of the empire. But then outside of that, it's a poor city. And I wanted to get that into the film and make it feel raw, like the real place. Important subtext of our story because Cal is a guy who knows the back way in. We purposely have avoided the classic DC shot. We have a whole sequence that takes place in Ben's chili bowl. And background, background. and action. And uh, that's a Washington institution, you know, it's in the real black neighborhood. And uh, Bill Cosby dated his wife, it has a sign up which says, you know, no one eats for free at Ben's except Bill Cosby. And also, Cal doesn't live in Adams Morgan and the fancy neighborhood. He lives in Mount Pleasant, which is an El Salvadorian neighborhood, kind of just outside of it all. I wanted to find places that were visual and unusual and had great texture, but weren't necessarily what you associate with DC. And one of the things that all the locals do in DC is they eat a lot of crabs and they go to this little place underneath the freeway. So I thought we'll set a little scene there. You know, coming from documentaries, it's nice just to have a bit of the real world around, to get a few things for free. You know, in filming in the studio, you get nothing for free. Everything is, it has to be planned, and you have to know exactly what you want. Here, suddenly, you see something, you think, oh, there's a, a pile of crabs, let's film that. Or, you know, something, the sun's in a different place, and something else looks beautiful, and there's a spontaneity to it that's, that's fun. And this is one of the nicest locations we've got here. Uh, and apparently, it's about to be knocked down, so we're lucky to be here. Cut! The core of the movie is the relationship between Russell's character and Ben's character. It's really what's driving the story. One of them has to be a kind of schlump, and one of them has to be this kind of glossy, telegenic figure. And with Rodrigo Prieto, a fantastic cinematographer, managed to help me achieve that. We decided to have two different worlds or styles in, in the movies. We ended up narrowing it down to uh, anamorphic lenses on the film cameras for Cal's world, handheld and uh, for Steven's world using digital cameras to get a little bit of this uh, artificial video look that's subtle, but we want it to represent the way you see politicians as an audience on television. The other thing we did was Steven's world, we used uh, greater depth of field, which means that the background and the foreground is a little bit sharper, a little more in focus. Whereas Cal's world, we kept the backgrounds uh, with the anamorphic lenses, softer. So it's a combination of the texture of digital and the you know, deep focus for Steven's world and the handheld anamorphic lenses, film, grain, and shallow focus for Cal's world. You have the layers of the story that's going on, but also there was a lot of layers that we had to shoot before we actually started filming. We have the website for foydog.com, the news on television we had to create beforehand. We had stills, which was for story points all the way through. We had to create day breaks for the newspapers. So whenever we were shooting, we always had the right paper there for the day. We tried to reflect two things. One is on the first day, the story is very small, the original shooting in Georgetown. Then as the story grows, it starts to take up more and more space in the paper. And we also tried to get a little more tabloid. So we not only wrote specific stories to reflect the news, but we also tried to sort of evolve the look and feel of the paper based on this pressure they were getting from the new owners. So it's totally realistic. In a way, I used to say to people, I used to say, you know, this is not a film with any special effects, except one. Our special effect is our newspaper set. That was sort of where we put all our love. And I was really lucky to get Mark Friedberg to design this. When he got involved, I knew that we were gonna get something really special. The idea of doing a newsroom, you know, it's, it's up there with Spaceship and Civil War Battle and Newsroom is an iconic movie set to make. I very much wanted to make it more than just an office. It's an organism. It's really sort of a, a, the central place unto itself. It was still over two stages, opened up to be together, and it was double height. We had some days, I think, 250 journalists in there. It's uh, roughly about 20,000 square feet. We took advantage of the height. The set is pretty much built up to the stage walls, and that was probably the main design decision. 
One of the ideas that we discussed early on, both Kevin and Rodrigo and I, was the idea of perspective. And so the balcony actually has become not only a part of the set, but a camera position. I worked uh, very closely with Mark in terms of designing the lighting for that set. I wanted it to be mostly practical light that you can see in frame. So choosing what type of fluorescent lights, where to put them exactly. So it was really exciting to shoot that set. And if you can make fluorescent lighting look beautiful, you're doing something. Oh, I did. Thank you. My concept right from the beginning was that if you imagine the newspaper set for all the president's men, and if you imagine that that set had been lived in and worked in and, uh, and allowed to get dusty from being the glowing stars, from being the investigative heroes from the 70s to being now no longer heroic, well, that's our set. To create that was just monster, just huge numbers of trucks. The set dressing people seem to be taken by the amount of sort of junk that's still on newsroom desks, because you would think in the computer age there wouldn't be a lot of paper, but it's, it's sort of everywhere. We all live in the digital world, but they all still live in the very paper world. The running joke was, you know, I'd come on every day as they were set decorated, and I would just sort of look around and sort of yell, more paper, more paper. And it was the layers upon layers that had to go into a newsroom. I mean, journalists are pack rats when it comes to paper. And it's piles, people's desks, just piles, piles, paper everywhere, everywhere, every books, magazines of just shit everywhere. Cheryl Karasik is our decorator, and she sat and with her team. They, they gave each place a personality, and that's important. I don't know if it's possible to be a method designer, but Cheryl did channel Cal a lot in, in the creating of his world. We had to use a set to get in the reality of the world of newspapers, and it's been an interesting process for me doing something that uh, is outside of what I usually do. You feel that intensity of in the newsroom. The actors are working through issues, working through questions. You see all their brains sort of spinning. We really do portray that. Thank you. What I hope is people will come away with a sense of what journalists are all about. They see their job in a very profound way, and they see it as a service to their community, to their culture, to the world at large. Kevin on State of Play, he was taking on you know, a colossal feat when dealing with an ensemble cast like this and the scope of the story, but he never lost what he wanted the vision of the movie to be. One of the things that got me fascinated by doing this film was looking around and seeing what was happening to the newspapers all around us. And these are the sources of the news that we get, the, how we know about the world, and yet they're dying around us every day. You start to think, what does society look like if you don't have reporters who are being the watchdogs for us? The reality is the democracy works best when there are great journalists and great legislators and strong, smart courts. The whole movie ends, I think, with almost my favorite sequence in the film, which is the Washington Post allowed us to print our own newspaper at their printing press in Virginia. And you see what a lumbering, analog, old-fashioned technology this is. And it's a kind of requiem for newspapers. It's a, little, it's a little last hurrah for the power of the press.